It's chapter book story time again here at the Caribou Public Library. Thanks for joining us. I'm Miss Erin and we are continuing in Black Beauty by Anna Sewell and illustrated by Fritz Eichenberg. We're on chapter five and six today. So we'll get started. Chapter five is called A Fair Start. There we go. All right. The name of the coachman was John Manley. He had a wife and one little child, and they lived in the coachman's cottage very near the stables. The next morning, he took me into the yard and gave me a good grooming. And just as I was going into my box with my coat soft and bright, the squire came in to look at me and seemed pleased. John, he said, I meant to have tried the new horse this morning, but I have other business. You may as well take him around after breakfast. Go by the common and the high wood and back by the water mill and the river. That will show his paces. I will, sir, said John. After breakfast, he came and fitted me with a bridle. He was very particular in letting out and taking in the straps to fit my head comfortably. Then he brought a saddle, but it was not broad enough for my back. He saw it in a minute and went for another, which fitted nicely. He rode me first slowly and then a trot and then a canter and when we were on the common, he gave me a light touch with his whip and we had a splendid gallop. Oh, my boy, he said as he pulled me up, you would like to follow the hounds, I think. As we came back through the park, we met the squire and Mrs. Gordon walking. They stopped and John jumped off. Well, John, how does he go? First rate, sir, answered John. He is as fleet as a deer and has a fine spirit too, but the lightest touch of the rain will guide him. Down at the end of the common, we met one of those traveling carts, hung all over with baskets, rugs, and such like. You know, sir, many horses will not pass those carts quietly. He just took a good look at it, and then he went on as quiet and pleasant as could be. They were shooting rabbit near the high wood, and a gun went off close by. He pulled up a little and looked, but did not stir a step to right or left. I just held the rein steady and did not hurry him. It's my opinion. He has not been frightened or ill-used when he was young. Hmm. Oh, there's a picture <laughs> of him in the stall and the little pony next to him. That's well, said the squire. I will try him myself tomorrow. The next day I was brought up for my master. I remembered my mother's counsel and my good old master's, and I tried to do exactly what he wanted me to do. I found he was a very good rider and thoughtful for his horse too. When he came home, the lady was at the hall door as he rode up. Well, my dear, she said, how do you like him? He is exactly what John said. He replied, a pleasanter creature I never wish to mount. What shall we call him? Would you like Ebony? Said she, he's as black as Ebony. No, not Ebony. Will you call him Blackbird like your uncle's old horse? No, he's far handsomer than old Blackbird ever was. Yes, she said, he is really quite a beauty. And he has such a sweet, good-tempered face and such a fine, intelligent eye. What do you say that we call him Black Beauty? Black Beauty, why, yes, I think that is a very good name. If you like, it shall be his name. And so it was. When John went into the stable, he told James that master and mistress had chosen a good, sensible English name for me. That meant something, not like Marengo or Pegasus or Ab Abdullah. They both laughed and James said, if it was not for bringing back the past, I should have named him Rob Roy, for I never saw two horses more alike. That's no wonder, said John. Didn't you know that Farmer Gray's old Duchess was the mother of them both? I had never heard of that before. And so poor Rob Roy was killed at that hunt. He was my brother. I did not wonder that my mother was so troubled. It seems that horses have no relations. At least, they never know each other after they are sold. John seemed very proud of me. He used to make my mane and tail almost as smooth as a lady's hair, and he would talk to me a great deal. Of course, I did not understand all he said, but I learned more and more to know what he meant and what he wanted me to do. I grew very fond of him. He was so gentle and kind. He seemed to know just how a horse feels. And when he cleaned me, he knew the tender places and the ticklish places. And when he brushed my head, he, was as care he went as carefully over my eyes as if they were his own and never stirred up any ill temper. James Howard, the stable boy, 
who was just as gentle and pleasant in his way, so I thought myself well off. There was another man who helped in the yard, but he had very little to do with Ginger and me. A few days after this, I had to go out with Ginger in the carriage. I wondered how we should get on together, but except laying her ears back when I was led up to her, she behaved very well. She did her work honestly and did her full share. I never wished to have a better partner in double harness. When we came to a hill, instead of slackening her pace, she would throw her weight right into the collar and pull away straight up. We both had the same sort of courage at our work, and John had oftener had oftener to t hold us in than to urge us forward. He never had to use the whip on either one of us, and then our paces were much the same. And I found that it was very easy to keep step with her when trotting, which made it pleasant, and my master always liked it when we kept step well, and so did John. After we had been out two or three times together, we grew quite friendly and sociable, which made me feel very much at home. As for Merrylegs, he and I soon became great friends. He was such a cheerful, plucky, good-tempered little fellow that he was a favorite with everyone, and especially with Miss Jessie and Flora, who used to ride him about in the orchard and have fine games with him and their little dog, Frisky. Our master had two other horses that stood in another stable. One was Justice, a roan cob used for riding or for the lug luggage cart. The other was an old brown hunter named Sir Oliver. He was past work now, but he was a great favorite with the master who gave him the run of the park. He sometimes did a little light carting on the estate or carried one of the young ladies when they rode out with their father, for he was very gentle and could be trusted with a child as well as Merrylegs. The cob was, the cob was strong, well-made, good-tempered horse, and we could sometimes have a little chat in the paddock. But of course, I could not be so intimate with him as with Ginger, who stood in the, sta in the same stable. <laughs> Chapter six is called Liberty. Here is the picture. <laughs> Liberty. I was quite happy in my new place, and if there was one thing that I missed, it must not be thought that I was discontented. All who had to do with me were good, and I had a light, airy stable and the best of food. What more could I want? Why, liberty. For three years and a half of my life, I had had all the liberty I could wish for. But now, week after week, month after month, I had no doubt year after year, I must stand up in a stable night and day except when I'm wanted. Then I must be just as steady and quiet as any old horse who has worked 20 years. Straps here and straps there, a bit in my mouth, and blinkers over my eyes. Now, I'm not complaining, for I know it must be so. I only mean to say that for a young horse full of strength and spirit who has been used to some large field or plain, where he can fling up his head and toss up his tail and gallop away at full speed, then round and back again with a snort to his companions, I say it is hard never to have a bit, never to have a bit more liberty to do as you like. Sometimes, when I have had less exercise than usual, I felt so full of life in spring that when John has taken me out to exercise, I really could not keep quiet. Do what I would, it seemed as if I must jump or dance or prance, and many a good shake, I know, must have given him, especially at first. Oh, I must have given him, but he was always good and patient. Steady, steady, my boy, he would say. Wait a bit and we'll have a good swing. Soon get the tickle out of your feet. Then as soon as we were out of the village, he would give me a few miles at a spanking trot and then bring me back as fresh as before, only clear of the fidgets, as he called them. Spirited horses, when not enough exercised, are often called skittish. When it is only play, some grooms will punish them, but our John did not. He knew it was only high spirits. Still, he had his own ways of making me understand by the tone of his voice or the touch of the rein. If he was very serious and quite determined, I always knew it by his voice, and that had more power with me than anything else, for I was very fond of him. I ought to say that sometimes we had our liberty for a few hours. This used to be fine this used to be on fine Sundays in the summertime. The carriage never went out on Sundays, because the church was not far off. It was a great treat to us to be turned out into the home paddock or the old orchard. The grass was so cool and soft on our feet, the air so sweet, and the freedom to do as we liked was so pleasant to gallop, to lie down, to roll over on our backs, or to nibble the sweet grass. Then it was a very good time for talking as we stood together under the shade of the large 
chestnut tree. Well, that's the end of our chapters for today. That last little bit made me think of the picture there at the beginning of the chapter. Can you see them when they had their free time? Rolling around on the grass, <laughs> enjoying their time together. Well, thanks again for joining us and we will see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Until then.